from the time I was born in the hospital until the time I clinically died in the hospital at 11, 11 p.m. in operating room number 11 for 11 minutes. It's this amazing tree, and this is where my life review took place. I could see all this in slow motion taking place, and this rotating tunnel began to spin at a very unusual speed. And it was at this time um, that I began to see people from my past. Welcome back to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Today, I'm chatting with near-death experiencer, Peter Anthony. Peter had his experience due to medical complications at a time when he was at the height of a TV career. When he returned from his NDE, it was with some exceptional after effects, with very accurate psychic abilities, the ability to see auras, and the gift of mathematical codes. These after effects not only prompted a massive career change for Peter, but they also prompted very personal change as well. Today, Peter is an author. He's a TV producer, a spiritual life coach, an expert in ancient numerology, and a contributing writer for many regional and major magazines, including the John Hopkins Medical Publication. No small feat. In 1995, Peter's NDE abilities landed him on Fox's hit paranormal show, Sightings. And as a psychic detective, he was working for paranormal and forensic experts. He helped to resolve forgotten murder cases, explored haunted houses, cemeteries, caves, and even concentration camps. He's appeared on the Lisa Gibbons show, Borderline, Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction, Celebrity Seance, Coast to Coast, The Jesse Dillon Show, and many, many more that I don't need to name quite now. Peter has written two books, Key Master and The Accidental Prophet, and I highly recommend, if you can get your hands on these books, to check them out. So Peter, there is so much in that introduction alone, and I'm so happy to have you here. Welcome to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Well, thank you very, very much, and I also say to your listening audience, uh, thank you for tuning in. I, I learned something on the other side called choice, and you know we have a choice today to, to listen to another near-death experience or talk and share their story. And, and if you're tuning in, I thank you for being a part of my life at this time. So thank you and, uh, and thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. I can't wait to get into this. So Peter, take us back. What was going on in your life? How did your experience happen? And tell us about your journey. Well, I, I was in the height of my career at CBS News Division. Um, I was a freelance image consultant and I was working with uh, Dan Rather, for those who know, uh, you know, who this man is, I'm sure down, you know, down in your part of the country, you may or may not know, but Dan Rather, Diane Sawyer, Leslie Stahl, I had the chance to work with so many, three different presidents and the first ladies. I was in the height of my career uh, with CBS News Division, traveling all around, you know, uh, as, a, as an image consultant. And um, I want to do a very quick backstory. Before this, I was agnostic, so I didn't have any belief in the spiritual realm. I stuttered. Um, I was an extremely shy, introverted person, and I had a speech impediment. Um, wow. So I think part of the whole journey of the change on a professional level, at least for me, uh, looking back at my life, I think one of the most important things that occurred in my life is I was able to come back and talk uh, minus the speech impediment. So in the height of my career at CBS News Division, we were having a rap party and we had finished at that particular time uh, uh, with a, a special interview with uh, one of our uh, a, a celebrating Academy Award winning actress. And we were wrapping up on that. And I also was invited to a pre-birthday party for myself with, at that time, there was a, a, a series called Dallas. And I was a, a guest of, 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 um, of Linda Gray. And so we were celebrating my birthday and it was at, at the at that celebration of my birthday, I became very ill. Now, prior to that, I had been misdiagnosed. June fourth, I'll never forget this. Um, in 1987, the doctor thought I had a, a stomach ulcer, and at this time, we were in the height of the AIDS epidemic. And um, so, rather than diagnose me correctly, I was being treated with the wrong medications. Now, back then, during the 
you know, during the height of the AIDS epidemic, pretty much what we're going to today, there was so much negativity, so much hype, so much fear. And as I began to lose weight all summer, and, and I'm talking about a lot of weight, um, I began to get these brown lesions on my torso, on my neck, and on my face. And I, at the time, was 165. I dropped to 140. Then I dropped to 130. Then I dropped to 110. And then I think by the time I went to the hospital, I was at 100. And because CBS News was such a conservative organization, I was stuffing my suit with newspaper and Kleenex. Oh, wow. And I was putting, I know, because I didn't want anyone to see that I was ill. And of course, back then, you know, there was so much negativity and fear towards the AIDS epidemic that many people were being, you know, were being fired. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't know, uh, you know, how it was spread. Uh, no one knew anything. So there was so much fear mongering going on and nothing was being done, you know, in terms of government. So me, I didn't want to lose my job. CBS, the news vision was conservative. Um, again, being freelance, I, I, I just didn't want to take the risk. So I avoided all the doctor's appointments, taking the wrong medications. And I think by the time I got into October, as I mentioned, I was touching at 100 pounds, putting makeup on my face so they couldn't see the, the brown spots on my neck and on my face. Mm -hmm. And then on November the 11th, um, at, at my wrap party, it was the perfect storm. I was about to eat my birthday cake, and I, it was like five, four, three, two, one. I doubled over in pain, excused myself, and went to the bathroom, and I just started bleeding all over my suit. And uh, so I excused myself. Uh, I went home, contacted a friend because I hit the ground when I got to the door. I put on some thrift clothes because I didn't want to go to the hospital in a suit. So I had a, a box of clothes going to the Salvation Army. And I remember putting on some holy jeans and a frayed shirt and mismatched shoes and didn't realize that this was going to be my <laughs> a, a, the, the ticket to a social profiling. And so when I got to the hospital, um, they wouldn't check me in. And they just assumed that I was homeless. Um, they thought that I was gay and I was in the final stages of the AIDS epidemic. And back during the, the, the late eighties, this was just a part of the, of the conscious protocol. I mean, that's just where people's heads were. And so they refused to check me in. I had a friend there uh, who screamed and hollered and just threw a fit. They eventually, um, found a, uh, a young nurse an intern to, uh, to, uh, to, who suited up like I was radioactive and rolled me in towards the ER and he freaked out because uh, I was trying to ask him what was wrong with me and why were they all suiting up and why were they afraid to check me in and literally Kirsty, he just pushed me in a corner and ran away and I was there for an hour maybe an hour and a half bleeding to death oh, and wow. um, so you know it wasn't until much much later in the evening uh, that uh, another nurse was walking in through the exit door and saw me there and she was the one that went to, I guess, to proper protocol. And, and uh, I begged her to, to get me to the ER where I could get checked in. And I remember no one, none of the doctors, none of the, uh, none of the anesthesiologists, no one back there wanted to check me in because they just assumed I was in the final stages of AIDS. And here I was bleeding, you know, on, my, on the gurney. Here I am in, in ragged clothes. And I remember they put me in cubicle 11. It was a curtain. And I remember they pushed the curtain back and they reeled me into the cubicle and I could hear uh, her name was nurse Sullivan telling the doctors that someone needed to help me out. This wasn't even her floor. And uh, so anyway, the doctor screamed and said, nurse Sullivan, you know, what have you done? You brought a man here with AIDS. He's bleeding all over the place. You've exposed us to the, um, to the AIDS epidemic. So um, she pulled the curtain back um, and I'll never forget this as long as I live. I mean, she said, this is going to hurt. She took my clothes off. She came back with a mop and water, scrubbed the floor, scrubbed me, uh, put me in a hospital gown, and literally reeled me out of the cubicle 11 and went and tapped on the OR and was trying to get doctors uh, to get me prepped for the OR to go into surgery. She went out of her way uh, to help me. And I'll never forget mm -hmm. that. We, her daughter and I are still friends to this day. Oh, that's but, um, right. Yeah, but but it happened. And so as I got into the OR finally because of, of Betty Sullivan, um, I think this is where everything began to occur for me. Um, at this time, I was in and out of consciousness. I, I remember everything seemed to go in a slow motion, uh, pause mode, a, a 
uh, you know, if you're watching a movie, it's like they all of a sudden everything, just the sound mutes out and, you know, every actor is moving in just very slow pace movement. And I looked around and I could hear at this time the doctor's thoughts and the anesthesiologist, excuse me, the anesthesiologist's thoughts. I could hear their, their thoughts. Don't ask me how. I just remember I was in and out of conscious. I could feel my body. Actually, I should say the spirit form of Peter Anthony leaving my physical body. And I remember uh, they turned me over my side. Uh, my veins uh, were collapsing because I'd lost so much blood. And I remember the anesthesiologist said to me, you know, this is going to hurt. And he turned me over my side, and I don't remember much of what happened, but I remember everything went black, everything went dark, and then there was this light and a snap, and I could feel uh, something attached to my solar plexus as though it was a cord, as though it was being vacuumed. And it was at this time that I could see uh, what I call the bullseye, a, a rotating tunnel. And I remember feeling as though I was being pulled towards this tunnel. But at the other end of that dilemma, that, that medical dilemma, I could see me, in, I guess, in spirit form, looking down at Peter Anthony in physical form. And I could see from above the doctors and the nurses going to medical protocol. And, but I could also see to the very far corner of the room over a clock or, um, um, you know, excuse me, the, this rotating tunnel uh, and above was a clock, a digital clock. I could see all this in slow motion taking place. And this rotating tunnel began to spin at a very unusual speed. And it was at this time um, that I began to see people from my past. And when I say people from my past, not my sister, not my brother or my father or my grandparents had already passed, but people from my past lives that I had recognized centuries ago, and if you will, and these costumes, these period costumes that, and they were all standing there as though they were welcoming me into this tunnel. And I recognized all of them. It was an immediate uh, recognition. Mm. Um, but I remember that happening. Then I remember the paddles going to my, to my torso. And I remember going back to my physical body and that I could feel again, this tunnel, this, this, this cord attached to my solar plexus and I was hovering over my body. And then the next thing you know, I see the second phase of, of people that had passed. Uh, I talk about in many of my videos, I remember seeing my third grade teacher, Mrs. Bellamy. I saw, uh, one of my high school sweethearts, I, I didn't even know had passed, and there she was. I saw a young boy that I played with um, that I was forbidden to play with. Um, and um, um, so I remember seeing all these people from my current lifetime greeting me at this tunnel. And mm -hmm. it, it just seemed, and, uh, so many people say, well, what were you thinking? And, and how are you acting? And, you know, all the thoughts are running through your mind. You don't really think and go, why is this happening? And who are you? And why, you know, why are you here, Gary? And what about you, Melissa? You're not thinking that. Or why am I seeing Mrs. Bellamy, you know, who is youthful and vibrant and, and not in a bad mood? But what I was seeing were these very vibrant, very upbeat, very pleasant, very nurturing souls before me. And I didn't question more than anything. I think what happens is you accept the reality of that moment because you know, for those of us who are on a, on a, on a spiritual journey, um, I think the most important thing for so many of us is being on a higher conscious level. And so for me, it was just this acceptance of what was happening to me and not doubting, not questioning, not being anything other than allowing myself to experience the experience. And you, you're saying that nothing was going through your mind at that point. You were just in the I was at peace. I was at, at this whole, yeah, I, you know, that's, you know, and so many people have had near earth experiences. I mean, the, the overwhelming theme that we talk about is the sense of peace, the yeah. sense of, of just being safe. And, uh, you know, for me, as I'm spinning through this tunnel, uh, one of the first things that took place as I'm going through this tunnel, I was seeing these triple codes, two, 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 three, 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 you know, nine, 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 seven, 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 you know, eight, 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 one, 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 or 11, 11. I, I remember quantum Within the physics. tunnel? Yes. All these wow. numbers, all these quantum physics geometry, and I wasn't very good at math, but as I'm spinning through this tunnel and seeing all these mathematical equations, I was digesting every mathematical equation and knew exactly what it was and what it meant. And as I'm going through this, I remember the, this feeling of peace. 
Uh, I think the second thing that took place in my in my um, in my tunnel was I was downloading so much knowledge. So I, I talk about this in my lectures. Imagine the mind of Darwin or, or Einstein or Tesla or uh, you know or your high school uh, English teacher or you know your college professor or you know or someone who's just a genius. Everything that had been put on this planet by collective consciousness was being downloaded into my consciousness. I mean, you know, imagine like reading the Bible, you know, in, in five seconds, or I imagine reading Einstein's theory in, in a couple of seconds. Everything was happening to me, and I was absorbing, digesting, understanding, and moving on to the next level. Part of that equation for me, besides the you know the, the mathematical equations and the triple codes and the peace, um, what I experienced was there was no judgment. There was no sense of, you know, of, as I said, you go back to, you question, you, you, you doubt, you think. You're not judging it. You're not, more than anything, you are observing and feeling your life and your, your sense of peace. I mean, it, you know, imagine, you know, sitting on a beach, you know, early in the morning and drinking coffee and, and having the waves wrap around your ankle. Well, multiply that by one million. I mean, that's just how much peace you're feeling. Mm. And as I'm experiencing the, the collective intelligence and the mathematical codes, the colors and the sounds that I was experiencing, is, it's as though my entire body, and excuse me, not physical body, but my, I guess my soul body, was experiencing so much. I don't even know how to explain it. Um, the, the sound, the colors, the music, everything was just beautiful. And again, I think what I say was I accepted it. I didn't doubt it. Mm. So there was no concern for what your body was doing back on the gurney? No, because you know what? It's not like you know, people go, well, did you see yourself? What did you, what did you look like? That's yeah. not where you are in consciousness. Yeah. You know, where you are in consciousness is, as I said, you know, as I said, you know, you don't, <laughs> when you're on the beach and the, and the, and the water's wrapping around your ankles, you know, you're not paying attention to, you know, um, you know, a couple having a conversation, you know, miles away. You are just in, engaged in that moment of peace. So it is your moment and nothing else matters but this moment of peace as you're going. I remember at the end of that tunnel, and this is the thing for me that was so incredible. Um, I ended up in a tree and and people said oh my god you really but it was it was this amazing tree and this is where my life review took place and i'm sitting in this tree and i i didn't know until i think it was in 2011 when i did my first near death experience lecture uh, for the ions organization and the facilitator told me oh my god you you were sitting in the tree of life i had even never heard of the tree of life and had no idea what the tree of life was but there i was experiencing my life review and that to me was, you know, there are so many things, and I know you've had many guests on who talk about their life review, but for me, I go back to the sense of judgment. There is no judgment. And as you are experiencing your life review, and, and there are so many things taking place. So again, we go back to this whole time continuum. There was, you know, you're not up there thinking, oh my God, this is three hours, or this is two minutes, or this is, you know, 35 minutes and 40 seconds. Your mind's not going there. Mm. But from zero to 60, your life spins before you. And every moment of your life, now think about what I'm saying here, every moment of your life from the time I was born in the hospital until the time I clinically died in the hospital at 11, 11 p.m. in operating room number 11 for 11 minutes. So on November the 11th, I died at 11, 11 p.m. in room 11. In OR room 11. Wow. For so for me, when I came back, you know, I came back with this quest for, for, uh, for numerology because I experienced so many codes on the other side. So as I'm watching my life review, and again from zero to 60, and so imagine that, um, you are looking at every moment, every goodness gracious. You know, what I say to so many people, we forget about the moments that we have in life, you know, going to get an ice cream, you know, or, or, you know, a, a friend that you say hello to uh, at a park or, you know, or, or an argument, 
um, that was your fault and you didn't take the, the time and the courage and the, and the, you know, the own your mistake, all these little rights and wrongs and, and shoulda, coulda, wouldas were all before me and I didn't judge it. You know, and there were times that I saw my actions where I, you know, looking down at it, looking, and I said, looking down because you are in this tree, looking at your stratosphere of, of your life review, like a matrix. And you're seeing every, every moment of your life that has been recorded. It's your life, your moment, your connection. And I think for me, the most important thing is where did I shine and where I didn't shine. And where I didn't shine, I remember inside my spirit form, you could have done better, Peter. And that's important because it allows us to take responsibility, what I learned on the other side, for our actions. So there is no blame. My husband's such, you know, he's so mean or my, my boss is, is, so, is so narcissistic. I mean, you know, we are given a choice. And that's what I learned on the other side. We are given a choice to stay in an abusive relationship or not. We are given a choice to stay in a, a, a job that we hate or not. Everything I learned on the other side is based upon our choice. And what I learned on the other side as I was watching my life review is when I did something that I was proud of, I could feel the sense of peace. And when I saw myself do something that, I, that, that wasn't so kind, I could feel this ping inside. And I think that ping that we all get, you know, we, you know, when we're doing something, we go, oh, I shouldn't be acting this way. That's our little uh, aha button, you know, I think from the universe, our guardian angels, our, our ascended masters, pinging us to say, okay, you're on alert now. So are you operating from the higher place of consciousness or are you doing something that you shouldn't do? And I think for me, I've learned to listen to the ping, to the aha moments because of my life review. A good example was I, um, watch someone bullying one of my high school buddies who uh, was mentally handicapped and I didn't do anything. I allowed it and I watched it. And as I'm reviewing this, I could see and hear my thoughts, me looking at me as a young boy, as a young teenager, not helping Mikey out. And I'm watching my football team bully him. And I was more concerned about getting to class on time than I was about helping someone. And so when I came back, the first thing I recognized within my own consciousness that when I see someone that's being bullied, whether it's a, a, a person or a cat or a dog or anybody, I step up to the plate because I remember looking down at that moment in life. And again, that shoulda, coulda, woulda moment where you say to yourself, I could have shined a little better than that. And so throughout my life review, and I say this so oftentimes in my lecture, it's not like I robbed a bank. It's not like I, I, I murdered my neighbor. It's not like I, uh, you know, I, you know, ran off uh, a bridge and, and tried to kill myself. I mean, none of those things. That's just not who I was. But it's those little things in life that we do that really add up and matter. And so I think for me and how it works for me and what I've learned in the side, I try my very best to be the very best person on a daily basis because I think the most overriding thing for me when I did come back and the, and the complications I experienced besides losing my eyesight and, and, and weighing it at 89 pounds uh, for a long time and suffering on a staph infection on my face that went into my hairline and not being able to walk. I was in a wheelchair. So when you think about these things and for me, the most important thing is I can see today, I'm grateful. I can walk today, I'm grateful. I can't run anymore, but I can at least get on a bike and, and, and ride throughout the neighborhood. And I'm also charitable, and I'm also an animal advocate. So I do things in my life that, that I feel that by me taking good actions, it's not about, hey, look what I'm doing, as much as the inner peace that I feel from doing it. Mm. So the life review continued. I saw everything. And then I was taken to a place called Bordeaux. Now, many people who are on a spiritual, uh, I guess, journey will understand this. A lot of the evangelicals and the, and the very extreme Christians will not. But Bordeaux, for those who are studying Eastern philosophies, is, you know, it's like limbo. It's like purgatory. I call it the cleansing station. And for me... Okay. I got a chance to have what I consider a conversation and I'll call it God because again, I was agnostic. 
But I remember looking down at Mother Earth and I could see we as a collective consciousness, what we weren't doing. You know, I could, it was always though I was in a Zoom lens, Kirsty, and I could go into every country where the politicians were, you know, closing deals that had a lot more to do with their pocketbooks than it had to do with helping their, their constituents. I could see the pharmaceutical companies, you know, creating, you know, medications that cured a disease, but created three more diseases. Everywhere I looked down on Mother Earth, I saw the worst, but I also saw the very best. And I think about where we are in consciousness right now in this lockdown. And I remember seeing doctors and I remember seeing nurses and I remember seeing firemen. I remember seeing people who worked at the grocery stores. I didn't know at the time why, but I kept seeing what I call our fellow man rising up to the occasion and helping other people out on this planet. So for me, part of my journey coming back, even during this lockdown, every day I get on my bike and I go anywhere from 10 to 20 miles on my bike and in the neighborhood now, you know, people know me as Peter, the meter greeter, because what I do, <laughs> I go through the neighborhood and I think we've been so inundated with so much negativity. So I try to create the best possible sense of peace for the strangers on the street. Hey, how are you doing? Have a good day. I, mm -hmm. I really, my job is today, God provide the people, the places and the situations. And my job is to go out and be a peaceful candidate today. And that's what I do. Mm. And uh, we are, you know, so I, I remember when I was in this place called Bordeaux and looking down at what man was doing to the animal kingdom. And I'm not just talking about dogs and cats. I'm talking about horses, lions. I'm talking about, you know, polar bears. I'm talking about the dolphin, the whale, seal. I could see the mastering of animals that was beyond my, my sense of, it just didn't resonate with my heart. And to this day, to this day, I am so connected to the animal kingdom. And I think it's important that all of us, all of us, you know, on some level, I don't care if you donate to the, uh, to, to, to the, uh, to the causes of, of dogs and cats being abused or the environment, we all need to shift our consciousness because our environment is about to take a nosedive starting here this year and for the next 10 years. And we're on a time clock. And so when people ask me what I saw at this place called Bordeaux, I saw our future. I saw our planetary, where we as a collective conscious were going. And I've been talking about this since 2011. And people are just now beginning to listen to me. But, you know, think about where we are. The whole world is locked down now. Yeah. And so the, we go back to the theory of choice. Well, I can make the best of this, or I can say it in my house and, and be miserable and complain and and I can, you know, blame the politicians and, and blame my neighbors and, and mm. not wear my mask. Or, you know, I could go in the neighborhood and with my mask on and greet and meet and be happy and just try to spread as much love as possible. Oh, and partially. you just that's it. It's a real simple formula. What I learned on the other side is very simple. In the tunnel, you learn peace. At Bordeaux. I learned that we're all here to unite, you know, love thy neighbor, you know, to really help people out. You know, the thing I've learned, it's a very simple formula. We're either coming from a place of faith or we're coming from a place of fear. We're coming from a place of gratitude or we're coming from a place of, of, of greedy consciousness. Mm. You know, so you have to decide in your life as we rise to the occasion, where am I coming today? And if you don't succeed in this hour or the next hour, you have again, the possibility to do to make a better choice to be a better person because you just don't know that you are that person that is going to help somebody out today and i think for me what i've learned on this that every stranger on this planet that i come in contact with daily hourly if you will is a part of my feature film for peter anthony and so like a major film your film is nothing if you think about the lord of the rings being you know shot in New Zealand. Well, okay, so let's have the battle scenes. Well, think about all the extras. Think about all the extras we had as the elves and the orcs. Yeah. Well, if you don't have those extras in your life, it doesn't add impact to the movie. So every person in your life is a part of your of your journey. And so yeah. sometimes you have day players, sometimes you have extras. Sometimes the very person in your life is the very person that's going to be the co-star of your life for six months. I have to share something with you, and I, this is very important, and I'll, bring, I'll circle back around to, to Bordeaux. 
Yep. For the last six months, I've been on my bicycle and I've been going to this park to work out where I film my, one of my YouTube videos. And they, while during lockdown, they put in, you know, you can do chin ups, you can do sit ups. They put in this whole endurance program workout. And so I thought, this is great. So I've been going there. And for the last six months, there has been this lady who every time I come to the park, she's there. And we just started having a very casual conversation. And she said, well, did you see the news today? I said, oh, I'm Barbara. I can't watch the news. It really upsets me. She says, why? And I said, because I don't like the talking heads or the pundits. I said, because sometimes I think they really are just paid to, to sway our opinions. And sometimes I think what they say is wrong. So she decided that the next day she, she, she was going to be my talking head. So she would go get the LA Times of the Huffington Post. And she would read the news to me. And she would become the talking head and she would give her editorial comment of how, you know, how, <laughs> how she thought it should have really been spoken. Yeah. And we had this conversation go on and on and on. I said, oh, Barbara, you're so funny. We would laugh and we would giggle like two little children in a sandbox. Last Thursday, I showed up at the park and she was at her bench where I filmed one of my YouTube videos and she wasn't in a good space. And I said, what's wrong, Barbara? She goes, oh, I'm in a really bad mood today. And I said, why should, oh, I have a girlfriend and I think she's all messed up in the head and, you know, we're having our, our issues. And I said, oh, I said, well, tell me about it. She said, well, down at the shelter, you know, she's, you know, she's getting more food than me and I'm giving her my food. And she started talking about this entire, I guess, event. She was homeless. I had no idea for six months that Barbara that I've been speaking with has been, who's been my talking and is yeah. homeless, but you see, it didn't matter. Yeah. The universe, the, if you will, God, the ascended masters gave me a homework assignment and that homework assignment for me to get my news was, was from a homeless person who was the funniest person I think I've ever met. And I, there was no judgment. There was an observation. My, my mind went, Oh my God, I had no idea. And I felt, well, should I have said something? Should I, I was, I became very uncomfortable because I thought, but she didn't allow me to go there because she said to me, you know, I've been coming to this park for such a long time and you're the only person that had ever spoken to me. So think about her world yeah. and me, a stranger coming in, you know, taking his shirt off and doing his sit-ups and doing his push-ups and doing his chin-ups and, and, and having a good time working out and feeling good. And, She's admiring my bicycle and it didn't, it doesn't matter. So as I said, so we can make a choice to sit in our home and, and, and get frumpy or get out on our bike and go have a conversation with a talking head who reads you the news. And so what if she's homeless? It makes no difference. God has put before us a human being as a homework assignment. Mm. And my homework assignment was to be kind. Back to the Bardot, when you're seeing all this and how we treat each other, and I'll have to say this, humanity, and I really do mean this, mankind, humankind, men, women, children on this planet as a whole are really very kind and very caring and very loving. It's those people in power who become very greedy and, and don't have our best interests at heart. So on your show, I say to you today, for those be aware of the leaders who we put in power who are so eager to take our power away from us. We are given a choice right now to make some major changes in our consciousness this year and for the next 10 years. So when you're looking down from a place called Bordeaux and you're seeing laws that are being passed and animal king or the animal king that's being, you know, exterminated for the name of profit, what's going to happen in the next five years when there are no animals left? What's going to happen to, you know, the coastlines that are when, we, when the, 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 the solar caps are melting? This affects everyone. Mm. And so when you're on the other side, there's no judgment, certainly is observation. But you'll learn on the other side to make better choices for yourself every day, every hour, every moment. Mm. I know that's a lot I've given you, but that's... You know. That's all right. There is a lot in there. I'd love to circle back to um, ask some extra questions, but I'd love you to just share the full experience. So you're in Bardo and yeah, we can come back to the questions once you've shared your experience, because I'm aware that we can go down rabbit holes and divert and never actually hear your experience because there's so much richness in this, so much to talk about. 
Well, for me, once I came back, this became the, well, I was, I want to go back to something very important. As I was watching all this take place on mother earth and I'm sitting here having this conversation with fragment energy. And I say, there wasn't this God. I was born and raised Catholic. So I go back to that whole judgment thing and my whole perception of being a born and raised Catholic. But there wasn't this God in a white robe and a staff and a beard at the pearly gates having a conversation with me. The complete opposite. Everything I had been taught as a Catholic was kind of way off base. Uh, not the teachings of Jesus the Christ, and certainly not the teachings of the, of, of the Buddhist principles or the Native American Indians or the Kahuna or the Tibetans. All those theories are perfect. It's what we have done as collective conscious as men on this planet who have, you know, who have edited you know, for our own political uh, gain, for our own, you know, sake of this is how I feel, so therefore it's going to be. So I think for me, when I'm looking down at Mother Earth and watching all these mishaps, and I'm watching that this is, oh, I don't mean to get so so down, but I watched the massacring of horses that were being fed in the Everglades to alligators. And it just bothered me. And I remember screaming out, this is not what God intended. And I remember having this aha moment because here I am talking to this fragment of energy and I realized I'm having a conversation with God mm, wow. to this day, to this moment. You can, I've had so much, you know, negative feedback and flack from this conversation I had with God, but this is what I experienced on this side. Everything on this planet is based upon energy, everything. And I learned that every blade of grass that grows, every wave of ocean that wraps around our ankles, you know, every mountain that we climb, um, every uh, a moment of joy or sadness, everything is an energetic form. And when you understand that you are given a choice daily to make your life count so that you're the person at the park doesn't feel judged and doesn't feel lonely because you're having a conversation with her, it only makes her feel better and it only makes you feel better and how you shift consciousness as one person at a time. And so I think we have been locked down for the last six months here in the United States. And what has it allowed me, and I had a lot of time to think about my near-death experience, I am at this phase now called reflecting, restructuring, rethinking, releasing, reevaluating. And as I'm reevaluating and releasing and rethinking and restructuring my finances, and I even pulled a will together, all these things are allowing me to think about what's important in my life. And for me, I can't run because I lost, you know, when I came back from my near-death experience, I was in a wheelchair for, for over a year. And the medications that they had given me, I had an adverse reaction to all the medications, everything. Consequently, I lost my vision. Consequently, I still have problems with my legs. But for me, I can't run, but I learned to walk again. So for me, getting up and walking during this lockdown has been the best miracle I could ever ask for. Getting in my bicycle every day and riding 20 miles has been a miracle. And imagine like today, I saw hummingbirds all around me at the park. And the doctor said, when I came back, you may not see again. And you're not going to walk again. But in my mind, when I was on the other side and saw my life ahead as a writer uh, traveling around the world, lecturing to people about my near-earth experience and seeing the medical mishaps I would go through, I did not see myself blind. I did not see myself in a wheelchair. And I did not see myself stuttering. So imagine when you're on the other side and you're having this conversation with this energetic form called God. And I was given the choice, do you want to go back, Peter? Do you want to go back? I saw the worst of humanity, but I also saw the very best of humanity. And I knew on some small part, whatever that part was, I could play my part. And if it was for me to write books, if it was for me to go and do radio interviews, if it was me to travel around the planet, that became my future and that became my, my force to live, the desire to do something. And I feel like on some level, I was given a second chance, a second chance at life to do something that was worthwhile. And I think for me, and so many of us are looking for our authentic purpose. And I think I was lucky in that. Because I think so many of us are in jobs that we don't like, 
you know, where I see attorneys who want to be actors, I see, I see clinical pharmacists who, who want to be athletes. I see all these forgotten dreams and all these, because someone else's opinion, maybe their dad or their mother or their brother or a teacher didn't encourage them. And so for those people who feel that they're lost and, and are in a job they don't like or, or locked down in a relationship they don't like, you know, I say to you today, ask God for guidance, ask your inner soul for guidance, ask to be given the choice. As I always say, provide the people, the places, and the situations. And my job is to show up, period. My job is to say, okay, there's a homeless person, but I don't want to talk to her. That's not how it works. My job is just to show up, period, and let the universe do their job. I'm here on the, on the passenger side of the car, and God, universe, ascended masters, and angels are driving, and I just need to, to go along the ride. So when I'm given the choice, and I knew that I was going to walk again. I knew that I was going to see again. I knew that I was going to speak and not stutter again. When the doctor said they gave me three months to live, I did not allow their opinion to become my opinion. Mm. So I got off the medications mm. because I knew clinically that what they were feeding me was wrong. And so I began to take homeopathic remedies. This is where the spirit world came in for me, Chris, because the, the, the passing doctors and nurses that had, and patients who had been there before would come and visit me in my in, in IC, the ICU or would come and visit me in the in the in the uh, in my room when I was still covering and I remember the next day I was t- tell my girlfriend, okay, so I need you to go get me some garlic, I need thistle, I need uh, pure aloe vera juice, I need acidophilus and lots of B complex. And they were looking at me and I weaned myself off the medications and that's how I did it. Yeah. And so, you know, I remember walking out of that hospital and I didn't walk, I hobbled, but they said I would never walk again. I remember the doctor called me his miracle patient. I didn't, I hobbled to the elevator, but I remember saying to that doctor, I'm walking to the elevator. See? And I did. And that was the moment I knew that I was going to live because I changed my mind to change my, my consciousness. And I began to study numerology and to, and to study astrology. I began to decipher what are these codes that I saw on the other side? And we didn't have Google. So I went to the public library and a year later at 89 pounds, the staff infection and people thought I was, you know, I guess I was like the elephant man because I had the staff on my face and I was in clothes. Um, that didn't fit, obviously, because it was 89 pounds. Um, and people would look at me like I was the eyesore of the community. And I didn't care because I had to do my homework. I had to do my research. I had to figure out. I didn't even know there was a thing called near death. All I knew is that I went somewhere and had a conversation with some guy who had a lot of energy around him. And I, and I knew that I was given a choice. And I knew that I wanted to live. Wow. And I knew that I had to take different kind I had to completely reinvent Peter Anthony from my diet to my physical appearance. And I got off the medications. And when my sight came back, um, and my sight came back and my, my, my legs came back, not because of what I was doing. Yes. I contributed to part of that, but one of my girlfriends, uh, brought me to a, a shaman in India in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I was there for a week. Now this is where I went back to judgment because he came out and I thought, oh, my God, I have, you know, <laughs> you, you kind of think to yourself, have, <laughs> have I become such a whack job that I'm going to let this guy perform some kind of witchy woo-woo miracle on me? And, and, but what he did was amazing. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, one week later, my vision came back. One week later, I got my legs back. And it was a slow recovery of 89 pounds. But the staph infection went away. and. Uh, and it was at this time, and the people didn't believe me. They didn't want to hear my near to the story. So I did what any spiritual person normally does. You go within. And I began to read. And I began to study astrology and numerology. I began to try to figure out what these codes were. And that's what changed my life. And that was what led me to working on homicide cases because I was contacted by a homicide detective who wanted me to work on a case they couldn't solve, which had to do with some very odd codes. And also this, uh, this, um, unfortunately, but he, I identified him as being a serial killer and they didn't believe me until I discovered the evidence. But, um, 
he was at that time considered the victim. Uh, he was shot by a, a neighbor down the street for, for coming on to his son. And, and, the, and the father went down and shot this man. And I said, you know, this man's not a victim. This man is a serial killer. And I provided all this information. Don't ask me how. I just, from the other side, and to this day, ghosts appear to me and, and talk to me and give me information. And I listened to the boys that had died, and I was able to solve this crime. That led me to sightings. That led me to Borderline. That led me to the History Channel. I left CBS News, uh, went on to become the country's youngest paranormal investigator, wrote a book, longhand because I didn't know how to type, and I handed it over to a, uh, you know, to a woman that could type, got it to an editor, and got it to a, a client of mine at Paramount Studios. And it's as though I have to say this, and I know you understand this, Every part of my life, be it good or bad, as though it was guided intentionally because of mm. choice. Mm. Yeah. And so do you think that when you came back, you had this pathway laid out in front of you? Like you talk about how we have choice, but do, what about um, pre-planning before we come Great here? Great question. Here's, here's, here's the truth behind that. I knew, I didn't doubt me. I doubted the doctors. I doubted the people. You know, people gave up on me. They just, you know, identified me as a whack job because, mm. you know, here I am talking about God. Here I'm talking about the other side and what they're doing in the animal kingdom. I'm talking about uh, pandemics. I'm talking about fires around, you know, to this day, I have people contacting me. I Back in the 80s and the 90s, I talked about the fires in the sky. Mm. And people were looking at me like, what do you mean the fire in the sky? I said, I, I'll know it when I see it. Mm. And I talked about the master of the animal kingdom. I talked about the environment. I kept talking about all these things. I also spoke about what I learned on the other side was the rise of, of feminine consciousness. And I write about this in Key Master, my first book. And everyone was looking at me like, what do you mean? And I kept saying that women are going to play an integral part of the shift of consciousness. It is the women that need to take the reins of power. And so you can imagine in the lit world when the men who run these, the publisher, the publishing companies and the lit agents, and I'm talking about women, I thought, you know, I have a choice here. These guys aren't getting it. I need to start and start contacting the women. Mm, mm, <laughs> and they got exactly. it. Yeah. So you go back to in the beginning, did people believe me? No, they left me. Relationships left me. Um, my family disowned me. Um, you know, anything. You know, I was eager to talk about God. I was eager to talk about what happened to me on the side. And people weren't eager to listen to me, so they left. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember, you know, uh, people just didn't want any part of me. So, you know, mm -hmm. as I said, I think when we have put, when we're challenges are put before us, you can do one or two things. You can feel sorry for yourself and have a poor pit of party for Peter. Or me, I read and mm -hmm. I did my research. And that mm -hmm. phone call came in from a homicide detective. And I always say it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than have an opportunity and not be prepared. And I was prepared for that moment in life that changed my entire life. Mm. Choice. What was it like for you then, Peter, when you first when you first came into your body? Do you remember coming back into your body? Yes. What was that I like? I remember hitting my body and the pain that I felt. I could smell the drugs in my system. Uh -huh. I could feel where they operated inside of my stomach. Um, I could feel the poisonous drugs circulating all throughout my veins. I could taste it. And th that to this day, as me, as I'm sharing this with you, I remember that, that sulfur taste in my mouth was just horrific. I could not wait to get that taste out of my mouth. I did. I would, drink water, anything I could do just to get that taste in my mouth. And it was the drugs. You know, the morphine they put me on. I mean, the, the high doses of prednisone, which, which, which caused me to, to lose movement in my legs. Um, the, the, the painful arthritis that I experienced, I got gout. I had every reaction to medication that when you have had a near-death experience, and for those who've had NDEs, you know this, you come back hypersensitive. Mm. Mm. And so medications can really screw you up. So I had to learn everything I take to this day. I turn it over and see what, what side effects could possibly happen because if it's going to happen, it's going to happen to me. Mm. So I read everything. I became proactive with my own recovery. I don't drink, not because I'm an alcoholic. I just didn't want any booze in my system. I don't smoke. 
Yeah. I learned on the other side that body, mind, and spirit are one. And so therefore, if I'm going to practice my, my preach, I need to walk my talk. So therefore, mm -hmm. when I finally got my body back, when I finally was able to work out from 89 pounds, I'm now at 160 and I have a six pack stomach and I'm in the best shape ever. Mm. It's what you do. What's what's been given to you. Mm, and absolutely. that to me, as I said, when we go back to choice, if you're in a bad relationship, you have a choice to stay there or feel sorry for yourself. And you, well, I can't do that because I have no job. I had a lady who was a housewife at the age of 45 and never worked a day in her life. Her husband left her for a young woman, had three children. And I said, when she came to me for a reading, I said, you need to volunteer because I'm seeing here, you know, the race for cure. I had no idea what the race for cure was. It was the Komen Foundation, the race for cure for cancer. And she became the senior VP of the Komen Foundation. So we are given many opportunities in life by freedom of choice. And we can, as I said, feel sorry for us, but we can't blame the husband because on a karmic level, maybe you were abusive to your husband in a previous lifetime. So on some level, you've come back to balance that in this lifetime and understand what it's like to be abused. So mm -hmm. it doesn't mean you stay there and, and finish out the karmic, or maybe you already have completed that. So you move on. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, um, uh, I made fun of, of, of fat people in, in a previous lifetime. So I came back. Isn't that interesting? to learn how to, to work on the, on the body and to eat correctly. And, and, and I have so many overweight clients who come to me and I motivate them to take care of their bodies. So again, it goes back to choice. Mm -hmm. It's how you present a subject to somebody, not judgmentally, but, but you just present a subject to someone and say, this is what I learned. This is how it's helped me out. And this is what I learned how to, you know, what medications to take. What I take day in and day out, I call it what fuel I put in my body today is my is my fuel for my exercise tomorrow. Yeah. What I read tonight is my peaceful meditation for tomorrow. Who I thank for being a part of my life today is my thank you list for tomorrow morning. Because every day I get up, I bless my day with all those things I'm grateful for. And mm -hmm. I end my day with gratitude as well. So why would the universe not want to give me an amazing part of life? Mm. So you see, so the more you go to the table with thank you for everything you have given me and thank you for the ability to see. I, every day I thank God for seeing. I am so grateful to have my eyesight. I still have problems with my sight and I still have problems with, you know, with, with my legs, but I can walk. Yeah. And if exactly. I can walk, then I'm grateful. Exactly. So, as I said, so for me, it's just a matter of just, being connected to the very best part of my life and being the best person that I can be. And we all are given that choice, you know? And mm. so if I motivate you and then you go have a conversation with your husband or your boyfriend or your brother or your sister and you motivate them and they motivate someone else, one person at a time is how we shift consciousness. Mm. And that's what mm. I saw on the other side. Mm. I it's love our this. job, our duty. I love this, Peter. I love how you're talking about how we have the power to make decisions and to create the change. Because I think there's often a perception that when you've had the near-death experience or you've become more spiritual, you've had some kind of experience which has led you in a non-physical direction, that we no longer can create things and change things in the physical. So I talk a lot about regretless living, talk a lot about how through the smallest decisions and the smallest um, incidents of change, how we can actually create how things are going forward. And I think that's very similar to what you're talking about now, about choosing the things, you know, what you put in your body as your fuel for tomorrow, what you're reading, all of these little things are what's going to create our future. Thanks for tuning in to part one of this episode with Peter Anthony. You can join us again in part two of this episode, where I asked Peter about what it was like to come back into his body, what it was like straight after his experience. And we also chat a little bit about what he's been doing in his life since. He's done some pretty interesting work as a paranormal investigator, getting some slots on some major TV shows, and he shares a little bit more about his gifts and how they've impacted him, the way that they've shown up in his life. And I hope that you'll enjoy that and join us again in part two of this conversation. Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Let's Talk Near Death podcast show. If you've enjoyed it, Please share it with your friends, tell people about it. I'd love to get these messages out there. 
Don't forget you can also pick up your VIP access pass for additional content at patreon.com forward slash Kirsty Salisbury. You can connect with us via the Let's Talk Near Death Facebook page and I look forward to catching you for another episode soon.